Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beck, Chief Economist. Today, we are joined by macro strategist Chang Wei Liang and economist Samuel Se to talk about the present and future of digital currencies. Indeed, last month, Samuel, Wei Liang, myself, and a few others, including Ma Ying, Tara Menon, Duncan Tan, uh, Nathan Chow uh, of DBS Group Research, uh, published a detailed report on this matter. And this presentation will be largely based upon that. You can find the report by uh, Googling DBS and digital currency. The presentation today will be divided into two parts. Uh, Will Young will go first, and he will set the ground of the concepts and practices of digital currencies, both of public and private nature. After that, Samuel Se will take over, and he will focus on the biggest hub of digital currency activity in the world, which is China, and go over what's happening there with a specific focus on the ERMB. Uh, with that in mind, I will pass the mantle to Wei Young, who will now guide us through a series of slides. Wei Young, all yours. Thank you, Timer. So on slide two, uh, what we can see is that currencies being in a digital form is not an entirely new idea, right? Since the telegraph uh, was invented, financial institutions have been transmitting money across long distances in a dig digital way. With the invention of computers and uh, computing storage, Central banks have also been issuing managing reserves digitally for commercial banks uh, for over half a century. However, more recent advances in connectivity, mobility, and data storage have led to an entirely new class of digital currencies. New is a little subjective as uh, cryptocurrencies have already been around for over a decade. But the reason why these digital currencies are new and revolutionary is because they are prompting a paradigm shift in the way we think about money. Even with electronic money, we can still think of them as basically uh, coins with the same meaning as when they were first minted in the Asian era. So digital currencies breaks this old mental model because currencies have changed to become malleable software or programmable money. So when people start seeing currencies in such a new light, uh, innovation abound, and there are many novel applications being developed in the space, such as self-enforcing smart contracts. So these are brave new frontiers with tantalizing prospects on mass adoption in future. Moving to slide three, uh, let's discuss the, what, what forms uh, the group of digital currencies. The first wave of digital currencies are cryptocurrencies. They rely on cryptographic methods to maintain a decentralized distributed ledger, also known as a blockchain. It is shared across many computers or nodes and there's no single actor with control over the entire network. Any node can come and go as they wish. The ledger is used as a record of transactions and ownership, which enables the usage of cryptocurrencies as money. So the combination of being decentralized and de distributed results in a very high degree of robustness and resilience uh, to, to errors and attacks. So central banks soon notice how popular the cryptocurrencies were getting and they were intrigued enough to experiment with their own version of programmable money. So these new currencies don't necessarily share all the characteristics of cryptocurrencies, so they are more accurately described as central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. They hold the same value as their physical counterparts, but because of their programmable nature, they can bring about additional accessibility and efficiency compared to traditional payment channels uh, encouraging financial innovation. And of course, the development of these digital currencies by both private and public actors is being further reinforced by a concurrent rise in digital payments. So this was already, already a trend before the pandemic, but digital payments is likely to have risen exponentially this year as the pandemic leads to more people staying at home and transacting online. So amidst this fast expanding list of digital payment channels, CBDC is one way to enhance interoperability for all of them. Let's go deeper into what defines a cryptocurrency on slide four. So we found that bona fide cryptocurrencies can be distinguished from other digital forms of currency by five features. The first is their distributed nature where ownership and transaction records are committed in a ledger known as the blockchain that is shared over the entire computer network. This ensures a high degree of resilience and fault tolerance to crashes or network outages at the cost of a somewhat higher usage of computing resources. A second is uh, the consensus protocol, which determines how this network of computers agree 
on what transactions are valid in the shared ledger. So one of the amazing things about cryptocurrency is that parties who don't know anything about one another can come together and form a consensus on transactions. For Bitcoin, the nodes will accept the largest proof of work to be true. There's also another protocol known as proof of stake, where the validators put out a stake on the blockchain where correct transactions rewarded and a dishonest transaction is penalized by reducing uh, the stake. Third, the incentive for transaction validators who provide the computing resources to ensure transactions are entered honestly into the ledger. The way Bitcoin does it is to reward validators with a new Bitcoin added to the blockchain if they solve a hash inversion problem correctly. So this process is also known as mining. Other cryptocurrencies could reward by giving fees for lodging transactions into the blockchain. The fourth feature is that cryptocurrency depends on an algorithm that determines the creation and release of the crypto tokens. So Bitcoin uses the mining process to release a fixed amount of Bitcoin over time up to a maximum of 21 million coins. Other cryptocurrencies could be backed by conventional currencies, which are in turn determined by the amount of reserves. Uh, fifth, the high divisibility of crypto due to their entirely digital nature. So you cannot split a one cent coin into two halves and expect to use it. But for the Bitcoin, you can split it not just a thousand times or a million times, but 100 million times for use in transactions. So we are all clear about what makes a cryptocurrency. So let's dive in deeper to get an idea of how the Bitcoin operates on slide five. So Bitcoin was the innovation that started this wave of digital currencies introduced in a 2008 paper by a person with the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoins exist in a peer-to-peer -peer computer network holding the ledger with transactions signed by owners in private keys. A single Bitcoin is then just a series of transactions or block shown in this diagram over here. So that Nakamoto's insight is that if this Bitcoin blocks are added one after another onto a blockchain only after doing some computationally difficult work. Then it becomes increasingly infeasible for an attacker to go back to change a previous block after the blockchain has grown because it will require him to compute a solution for his block, but also all the subsequent blocks after it. So this is why the longest chain is the honest chain because it's almost impossible for an attacker to make a fraudulent chain longer than the correct chain. Uh, the correct chain without controlling over half of the network's compute power. So given the low chance of success, it makes more economic sense for nodes to behave honestly and earn the rewards via mining. And this is actually what happens in reality. So we now know how Bitcoin works. We know it's technically viable, but how does it stack out as an investment? So let's move to slide six. So the chart on the left shows market valuations of all the major cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin's market cap is the largest. It's already approaching 200 billion in June. It's now well above 200 billion dollars. Some of this gain is probably stoked by outsized monetary and fiscal stimulus that we've seen this year. As people grow more worried about inflation and excessive debt burdens globally. But what is sure is that Bitcoin is no longer just a hobbyist interest or a fad for retail traders. So consider the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which was the first to allow easy investment exposure to Bitcoin. So the table on the right shows that the trust's biggest holders are all institutional names. So we know investors are taking to it in droves, right? But is it as good as it seems? So there is plenty of uh, crypto skepticism, to be honest, even up to today. We'll discuss uh, it on slide seven. So we know there are eminent economists who have voiced skepticism about cryptocurrencies. And that is in some sense to be expected because every time a radical idea first surfaces, it naturally generates some controversy and plenty of opposition. But let's consider what the major arguments against a cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin. First, the argument that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. So it is not a precious commodity like gold or silver. So neither is there a central bank that guarantees price stability, unlike fiat money. And the second negative is that, therefore, the price of Bitcoin is extremely volatile, right? Which undermines the idea of it being a store of value. And third, Bitcoin is difficult to access and quite uneconomic to use because to broadcast Bitcoin transactions, you must run a full node with the entire blockchain. 
And the blockchain size is around 290 gigabyte in size, expected to grow at 20 gigabyte a year. It's very technically demanding. Non-technical people usually rely on third parties for assessing Bitcoin. And that brings about a fourth negative, which is that the risk of a loss of Bitcoins by your custodians if they have security breaches. And finally, due to the somewhat anonymous and decentralized nature of Bitcoin, there are many unsavory actors using the network for possibly illegal transactions. But if you consider them in a bit more, are these insurmountable problems? So the counterpoint to the intrinsic value argument is that actually cryptocurrency's value stems not from uh, the fact that it's scarce, but from its network value or whether or not there is a large and growing network of users who are willing to transact with it. So due to the simplicity and the security of the Bitcoin protocol over the years, more and more users have been adopting it and more and more developers are working to enhance it. So what that means is that the, the community is very much consolidating around Bitcoin. That provides uh, the primitive value of Bitcoin as compared to uh, it being used in a more traditional sense. The second reason is that Bitcoin's volatility can be tolerated if it provides additional diversification to a portfolio, additional resilience to a portfolio. So one of the interesting thing about Bitcoin, if you look at the daily returns of Bitcoin over the last five years, the, the amount of correlation that Bitcoin has with other assets is rather low, almost close to zero uh, if, you, if you discount what has happened this year. So what that means is that given an asset offers some diversification benefit, it should have a positive weight in your portfolio according to finance theory. So in this aspect, also the hedge that Bitcoin can offer is rather unique and valuable because it is also an insurance against catastrophic failure of the economic and financial system. Arguably, it's a very small tail risk, but it's important to some people, perhaps in emerging markets where risk surveillance is not strong or for some countries which are naturally vulnerable to disaster, natural disasters. And given the fact that there are no state or capital controls, it's likely easier to assess your Bitcoin stash uh, compared to, say, money in a bank account when there's a disaster. So all you need is connection as a, to a Bitcoin network. So in a way, it's somewhat more convenient than physical gold, which serves the same uh, purpose as a safe haven in a time of very high uh, uncertainty. And on the second, on the third point is that Bitcoin investment has become a little bit easier over time due to financial derivatives. And the, the Bitcoin trust is notable as an investment vehicle that holds Bitcoin and is traded in the US OTC stock market. So investing in Bitcoin is no longer as technically difficult as before. And the fourth point is that uh, while there, are, there could be Bitcoin wallet losses due to organizational mishaps, the Bitcoin network itself is actually super resilient. There's no single point of failure. Uh, what that means is that it's highly unlikely that the security of your of your Bitcoins will be will, will be compromised in any in any in any form um, due to some deficiencies in the protocol and in the network technology. Um, and finally, the, back, the the fact that there are bad actors is true, but bad actors are all over the internet and. Uh, what it really is the crux of the matter is whether or not regulatory oversight has, uh, has increased to a point uh, where they can cover cryptocurrency trading as well as payments. Um, Singapore, on its part, has done a lot by pushing forward the Payment Services Act and the rest of the world could very well follow suit in future. What that means is that abuse of cryptocurrencies is likely to, uh, to, be, to be minimized, at least in places with good regulations. So as a concluding thought, is it possible that we can have cryptocurrencies with some of these pros, but none of the cons? So this is perhaps one of the motivations behind uh, CBDC development, which we discuss on the next slide, slide eight. So CBDCs are digital currencies issued by central banks, primarily for payments, but they are likely extensible to other purposes uh, via availability of uh, API. So there are two possible models. One is a single tier model where the central banks give individuals direct access to CBDCs. The other is a two tier model where the CDBC access is given to payment providers who then interfaces with all the individuals and corporates that will use them. So most central banks that we know 
are leading towards the two-tier model uh, due to concerns over bank disintermediation. But just having a central bank managing the CBDC already, already it reduces fragility compared to uh, volatile cryptocurrencies and provides very high degree of assurance and safety for payments and other usage while also delivering on efficiency gains by leveraging on digital technologies. So for emerging markets, the benefits from providing a digital currency infrastructure is even greater because they can very quickly uh, increase financial inclusion. So in many emerging markets um, that were previously unbanked and underdeveloped, um, they are already starting to use mobile phones to wire money uh, across the country, uh, depositing and receiving money at cash counters. So the usage of mobile phone for remittances is actually a very amazing development over the last 10 years, and it has happened across many uh, very underdeveloped countries. But the problem is that people still need a company at the endpoints to handle the cash, since mobile technology does not go all the way to address this transfer of money. CBDC can become the specialized technology to solve this endpoint problem. It's tailored specially for payments and transfers, and there's perhaps even no need for physical money in the future. So at this point, it's also becoming clear uh, to central banks that payment providers are growing to become juggernauts. So in the future, this could imply some financial risk since so much money will flow through them or be held by them. So having regulatory oversight and enhancing stability is also another reason why central banks are embarking on CBDC development. And yet another reason is that CBDCs will enhance interoperability between payment providers, fostering greater competition, as well as preventing payment providers from having monopolistic power. And lastly, I think it's a more academic point where the rising usage of private currencies also pose unique problems to monetary independence. There have always been emerging market economies which are dollarized, right? Since dollars are widely used uh, in transactions, a similar loss of monetary policy efficiency, efficacy could also happen to countries if people are willing to accept private digital currencies instead, instead of a domestic uh, currency. So having CDBC, CBDCs readily available will prevent this from happening. So moving on to slide um, number, number nine, so CBDCs are already under consideration by 80% of global central banks. Central banks, which are more advanced in experimentation, have already decided on some key features. What are these fe key features that will comprise uh, CBDC? So they can be classified into four categories. Uh, the first one is whether they will be token-based, where the value is linked to a token, or account-based, where it's linked to an account where there's lesser degree of anonymity. Uh, second is whether it will be wholesale access, which is limited to banks, or whether it will be given uh, retail access available to all individuals, including possibly even non-residents and tourists. Uh, the third point is whether it bears interest, or more intriguingly, could it give negative interest? Uh, and fourth point is whether to use a centralized or decentralized ledger. So in the case of China, PBOC's uh, DSET, the Digital Currency Electronic Payment, uh, it will have loosely coupled account links, so there is a degree of anonymity, but not complete anonymity since it can be loosely traced to a particular account. It will also not run on a blockchain and it's not fully decentralized. Uh, Sweden's uh, RigSpan is testing various e-Krona implementations, possibly with the public having a direct account and claim the RigSpan. Uh, in Singapore, MAS is experimenting with Sing as Singapore dollar and ledger, which will be used for decentralized settlement. So the Singapore dollar and ledger will not be bearing interest at all. So given so much interest in private and uh, public digital currencies, we could ask what is the impetus driving all this? So it's very clear it will be digital payments. So moving on to slide 10, the left chart shows an Unmistakable, unmistakable global trend towards digital currencies, right? The global value of digital payments is expected to double from 2020 to 2024, and much of that growth will be driven by payments in Asia. An EIU survey also showed that online payments is the number one reason why people will use a digital currency. Or in this nexus of digital payments and digital currencies, 
will be one of the fastest growing areas in finance in the next four years. Digital currencies in turn will see a rise and take up alongside this increasing number of online transactions. One of the countries that have fully embraced mobile and online payments is China. And Samuel will give you the granular picture of what's happening in the digital currency space over there. Passing over to you, Samuel. Uh, thank you, Weilang, uh, and thank you, Tamo. So here's come to uh, my part of the presentation here is uh, more focusing on China. So um, as uh, discussed by uh, Weilang, China is uh, one of the first country that uh, initiated the use of CBDC. So China is first studying this in 2014 and recently rolled out the use of digital currency in the cities of Shenzhen, uh, Suzhou, Chengdu, and Xiong'an, a new smart city located near the southwest of Beijing. So um, although the regulation lead to a sharp fall of usage uh, in China, but China still is still leading in terms of hash rate. So, um, so if we look at the uh, chart on the left on slide 11, so we can see that uh, the average monthly share of total hash rate of China is at 65%, which is much higher than the rest of the world, like the US, Russia, and Kazakhstan. So um, this is because uh, the electricity is much cheaper in China. So if you are uh, uh, doing this kind of uh, cryptocurrency, um, uh, activities, then you, it requires a, a tremendous amount of electricity. And China has comparative advantage here because we have cheaper electricity or controlled price. Um, so uh, and if we look at the chart on the right hand side, we can see that the average monthly share of total hash rate is the highest in the western part of China because the electricity price there is even cheaper. So for example, like Xinjiang, Sichuan, uh, they has the highest um, average monthly share to the hash rate. So um, we have a um, comparative advantage here, uh, and that's why we have um, uh, more hash rates in the Western China. So uh, in fact, there are a lot of uh, strong reasons for China authority to develop its own digital currency, and we will go through it in the following slides. So let's go to uh, slide 12. So here is the chart on M0, M1, and M2. So we're going to discuss the development of the CBDC from the angle of cash in circulation. So cash in circulation is declining due to the growth in mobile payment, and such development reduces the need of using cash in China. So M0 is the money of circulation, like notes, bills, and coins, the physical cash that we're using for our daily life. And uh, its share among the GDP was down from its peak at around like 15%, um, in early 90s to around like um, less than 8% last year. So uh, the chart on the right also denoted the cash intensity. So cash intensity can be defined as uh, the ratio of M0 to M2, uh, which is the money supply. So China has the lowest cash intensity at around like 5% compared to 24% in the US and almost 60% in India. This is no surprise because you can now pay everything with mobile payment app in major or second cities, second tier cities in China, ranging from supermarkets to restaurant, taxi, street food sellers, or all sort of uh, entertainment. So uh, right now, China is, we can say, is, is um, highly digitalized, uh, especially in the core cities. So let's go to the next page, uh, slide 13, okay? So um, that's why the penetration rate of mobile payment is the highest among the world. Merchants doesn't take cash at all. When I, when I travel to China, uh, if, I, if I pay a taxi driver with cash, they probably don't have the changes for me. So um, right now, more than 80% of the smartphone users take mobile payments, uh, which is double of the first runner up Denmark, 40%, or the second runner up. Korea, third, uh, around 30 40% as well. So um, consumption payments through mobile apps right now account for around 16% of China's GDP, comparing to uh, around uh, uh, like 1% to 5% um, in, in the US and, and in the UK. Um, China is also a mobile first market, which means we have a higher usage of phone uh, here comparing to laptop or desktop. When you access your internet, you use your phone instead of laptop or desktop. And that's why the Chinese people 
uh, tends to accept the use of mobile pay payment. And um, another reason here is there are not many people uh, have or actually use the credit cards. So the usage of credit card here um, is around seven, uh, 40% uh, in two, uh, 2019, but the credit card per capita here in China is at around uh, 0 0.5, comparing to 2 to 3 in Hong Kong or uh, at least 1 point something to 2 in other economy. Authorized credit through credit cards was at around like uh, 17 trillion RMB, comparing to the transaction volume of mobile payment at over three, uh, uh, around 300 trillion RMB last year. So this is quite unique in China because China shifted directly from cash to mobile payment as given the development of credit card. Uh, compared to, to the Western world, credit card is king. Payment app adoption in the Western world is relatively slow because credit card is already very, you know, very convenient. So in China right now, 80% of the payments or transaction volume are going through by the third party mobile payment. Uh, the need of contactless payment is now on the rise because of the COVID. So let's go to the next slide on slide uh, 14. So in terms of market share, more than half of the mobile payment was handled by Alipay, uh, followed by Tencent uh, and WeChat Pay. Okay, so um, the second tier is also on the rise, like Yi Chenbao, which account for 1.5% of market share, which is owned by Ping An. And we can see there are other um, um, mobile payment app like uh, JD Pay or ePay, which is rising as well. But still, the market is dominated by the two tech giants, which is um, uh, the Alibaba and, and Tencent. Okay, but before I uh, move on, I have to stress the following. The EURMB is uh, not a third party payment. It is developed by the central bank, the PBOC. Uh, while the Tencent Pay or Alipay, they are linked to bank account. So it is more like a debit card for Tencent Pay or Alipay. This is, they are built based on retail banking accounts. So this means they are counted in M2 money supply instead of M0, like the eRMB. So um, if eRMB is widely developed, uh, there will be uh, further uh, involvement like the third party payments, uh, like uh, people right now can transfer their unused cash from Alipay to Yuabao, and turns out it become one of the largest uh, money market fund. The AUM is at around 180 billion US dollar, and this created another giant unicorn, the Ant Financial, which is going to go public on Hong Kong Stock Exchange very soon. So, in fact, there uh, the reason why PBOC established the EUMB is EUMB is that uh, the money market fund is highly leveraged. Okay, so commercial bank borrowed these funds and reinvested in wealth management products or shadow banking products, which is uh, high risk products. And some of them are hard to track as they are not registered on bank balance sheets. So these money are created outside the money supply, M2. So this is difficult for the monetary um, uh, authority to the, the PBOC to manage the risk and track the, the, the payment. So here come to the last slide uh, for my part. So therefore, the authority took the, uh, this is slide 15. So um, therefore, the authority took a lot of initiative to manage financial risk. Uh, for instance, the authority created a new central clearing system called the Nets Union Clearing. So right now, it's a, a two-tier system where um, they only link the bank and customer through the third-party app. But now with the new system, it allowed the PPOC to monitor the funds on the third-party payments and it makes the payments more transparent and enforce more stringent uh, reporting and regulation procedures. So with the CBDC, we can improve the measurements of currency supply, circulation, speed of money, uh, currency multiplier, and so on and so forth, and help formulating a better monetary policy moving forward. The second derivative here is but we can help reducing the bad debts, uh, default risk facing the financial institutions, uh, help monitoring the uh, anti-money laundering activities, and um, uh, the anti-terrorist financing. So with digitalization, the authority could use big data to identify suspicious trans transaction, which can promote a healthier financial market. So last but not least, we hopefully the, there will be um, uh, further development of CBDC, uh, which can um, develop into area like the trade finance in wholesale banking or cross-border transaction, like the trade or investment with the uh, 
Belt and Road Initiative, RMB international, internationalization, but this also hinge on the liquidity and comfortability as well as the stability of RMB. So, uh, and there is also a problem that we have to uh, look into is the uh, privacy, just as the what BIS has mentioned. Uh, there is no other um, uh, payment can provide the uh, privacy as good as cash. So these are the things that we have to um, uh, look into in the uh, in the future. So here is the end of my um, my presentation at slide uh, fifteen. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Samuel, and uh, thank you very much, Well Young. I will have a couple of questions for both of you. First, Well Young, uh, you showed in your slides the uh, sharp rise in the use of private digital currencies in recent years, and you also touched on how the use case has become more compelling this year as the pandemic has sort of nudged us toward using more digital transactions, and also there's been a search for safe havens. Um, in your view, are currencies like Bitcoin the new gold? What has been the Bitcoin gold correlation and performance this year? So I think it's fairly interesting uh, that you mentioned Bitcoin with respect to gold. So it's quite well recognized that the millennials are moving towards uh, Bitcoin. They see themselves as being more comfortable with the technology, being more aware of what this usage can be. Whereas older people, older investors tend to gravitate still towards gold. Uh, when they're looking at safe haven. But it's becoming increasingly clear that there are some, um, some, some degree of overlap between what Bitcoin can do and what gold can do, which is to provide a little bit of a hedge against uh, the risk of inflation, uh, to provide a hedge against a possible uh, threats to the financial system. So therefore, it's natural to believe that, that, that the degree of correlation between gold and Bitcoin should be rising. And that is indeed the case that we observed in recent years. So the, when Bitcoin first started um, back in 20, 2010, 2011, the amount of correlation of Bitcoin prices with gold is relatively low. But since 2015 to the most recent year, we have noticed that correlation between Bitcoin and gold has been steadily rising. Uh, that shows that more people are appreciating the fact that Bitcoin can provide the same sort of diversification benefits as gold, and they could be allocating a um, portfolio that was previously uh, given to gold into Bitcoin or other digital currency assets. So that is one trend that could be happening uh, and that, that might likely extend further into the future. But of course, they are two very different things. So Bitcoin fundamentally is software. Gold is gold. It's not going to change over the next year, over the next century. but Bitcoin as a software is going to rely a lot more on the intrinsic network value that people will continue to use and continue to develop further on Bitcoin. So that is a risk that Bitcoin investors will, will have to factor in their calculations, uh, whether or not Bitcoin will remain the preeminent uh, cryptocurrency in the space or not. And there are many competitors that are coming through. Um, albeit, I would think that Bitcoin easily has the strongest track record, as well as one of the largest development efforts uh, being uh, put into place uh, at this point in time. Uh, thank you, uh, Well, Young. Yeah, uh, this is space we have to watch in the coming months and years. It's a very interesting time, no doubt. Uh, going back to uh, Samuel, uh, you very briefly touched on the issue of ERMB being a path toward internalizing the uh, cur Chinese currency. Uh, and you, I think, very briefly also touched upon the possibility of trade credits and invoices getting settled in ERMB in the future. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so, um, so in the future, uh, when ERMB is uh, further developed, then uh, probably there will be some sort of like um, um, the uh, intermediation in the future that uh, because right now uh, we have uh, most of the uh, mobile payment uh, go through the third-party apps like Alipay or Tencent Pay, and these are all linked to, to bank account. So, so right now, the uh, payment, they are created outside M2, which means they are not not um, not an M0 currency, not a fiat money. But going forward, all these payments can go through uh, the central banks, the authority itself, instead of just the... Uh, 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 third-party payment apps. So uh, that will create uh, that will create an environment that uh, the authority can um, you know look into the uh, transaction more transparently, 
and uh, look into the tr suspicious transaction, uh, like the, all the payments, like invoice or um, uh, all the transactions, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we believe that this will be the new trend um, in the next couple of years, uh, because right now the third-party payment is um, it is quite difficult for the authority to control or to to uh, to to manage. Uh, because as I said, there are a lot of uh, money market uh, funds in, in, in China right now, uh, like the, the, uh, the Yuabao from uh, N Financial, which is uh, still difficult for the authority to manage. So uh, moving forward, we, we believe this, is, this will be a trend. But in terms of internationalizing the currency, uh, how would uh, trade, uh, credit, mm -hmm. trade invoices, th those things fit into the ERMB context? Yeah. So in terms of uh, trade finance or, or FX, that then that uh, requires another um, issue here. So which is uh, the other um, bank, uh, other central bank has to develop their uh, um, uh, digital currency as well. So um, uh, right now there are uh, like for example like uh, Singapore and other other central banks are also are creating um, uh, their digital currency, and that will also involve the FX settlement. Uh, between central banks and also between some sort of uh, commercial banks if uh, the uh, authorities would like to uh, invite a commercial bank to, to be involved in this kind of wholesale bank banking um, uh, products. So uh, this is not uh, not just in China, for example, like Hong Kong. Uh, the Hong Kong MA is also uh, having a pro uh, is running a project with the Bank of Thailand um, on on uh, wholesale banking products like trade finance and FX settlement. And I believe uh, if um, uh, other, um, uh, other central banks uh, in the world, like especially the Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, the major uh, growing trading partner of China uh, right now. So we believe that uh, if the uh, Euro maybe could be developed in China successfully and there will be more development in the Southeast Asia in particular, like the the like Thailand or other BRI uh, participants countries. So uh, there will be more uh, trade finance activities, activities through um, RMB or through uh, uh, the digital currency because that will sh uh, shorten the, uh, uh, the time for um, FX settlement uh, compared to the current model. Thanks, Samuel. I think uh, we should clarify for our listeners that ERMB does not mean internationalized RMB. Uh, there are two different things, as you have pointed out very clearly in your presentation earlier, that initial objective of ERMB is to sort of rein back the control of broad money supply and the e-commerce that is taking place in China. So that is more of a domestic push, if you will, uh, and to increase transparency over transactions by the PBOC. Uh, but eventually, uh, ERMB or a Bitcoin type uh, conduit could get in the way uh, uh, to help uh, or to facilitate uh, international transactions uh, during which uh, I could uh, invoice something on RMB and that could be settled e either through an E channel or through a digital currency or a crypto channel. So all sorts of things are possible going forward. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about uh, digital currency in the context of China. I want to go back to Wei Liang. Uh, the U.S. seems to be way behind uh, China or Scandinavia in this regard, uh, whether it is a digital usage or uh, serious central bank pilots in coming up with a use case for digital currency. Uh, can you give us a sense of where they stand? Right. So the U.S. has been extremely conservative in its approach towards uh, developing a digital currency. So it's only this year that they, has a, they have announced uh, a system known as the Fed now, which is to allow for real-time payments to happen uh, for financial institutions. And that is already what many countries have right now. Uh, so definitely a few steps behind what we have seen in China as well as Europe. And this system will also not be a system where um, it is extensible or as malleable as a CBDC. So what we think is likely to happen is that the U.S. will take some time to assess how uh, various CBDC development happens, what the pros and cons of various approaches before they actually embark on it. But I think there's quite a little bit of excitement in terms of what the possibility that, um, that having a CBDC or having a digital account for 
uh, every citizen in the U.S. Could, could, could bring to the table. So one of the possibilities is that it is it is uh, it can be used as a means of dispersing uh, UBI uh, or universal basic income to 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 all uh, in the country in a very fair and transparent manner. So that provides a new uh, way of uh, of executing of fiscal policy that is helpful in terms of gauging the impact of the of, of, of this policy. So, for instance, if you trans if you if you monitor the accounts and the amount of spending of the amount of money that has been transferred um, by this di digital ch channels, you could see what the velocity of money is, uh, what is it being used for, uh, how much of it is being used, how much real time impact. Uh, that we have on the on the real economy, and all this information can provide a very useful feedback to monetary policy makers as well. So it creates a very tantalizing possibility that monetary and fiscal coordination can be improved even further to bring about a greater efficacy in delivering uh, policy uh, objectives in terms of pushing forward uh, stimulus across the economy. So all this I think will be very exciting, but they are not on the table right now. They are probably it'll probably take some time before uh, we even start to see uh, efforts on on that front. But at the same time, I would also like to stress the private sector is pushing much further. So Facebook is pushing ahead with this Libra uh, cryptocurrency, and that could be very well be a model for uh, for for future uh, CBDCs in the US. Absolutely. So, William, I want to stay with you for the final question. You heard uh, Samuel in his China presentation talk about how the ERMB initiative is a way to bring greater degree of transparency and transaction tracking on the part of the central bank. So I suppose there is this tension right now. On one hand, you have the private digital currencies, which offer a world of privacy, which, of course, the regulators don't like. But the regulators themselves want some degree of transparency and tracking. Therefore, they'll have their own e-currency or digital currency initiative. Um, do you foresee a lot more regulation and restriction on the use of private digital currency going forward? Or it is one of those things that's just too late now. It'll be with us and the central banks have to just live with them. I think the reason why cryptocurrencies have uh, become more anonymous or have, were originally anonymous was due to the fact that it was still very much in the phase of experimentation. So now we are moving into a phase where these are being used in um, in, in, in large scale financial transactions. So we, we can't really argue that there shouldn't be regulations on that or that regulation should be a light touch approach. So what I do know is that there are various efforts among private actors to exclude um, Bitcoin that has been tainted, that has moved through the dark web, that has um, been used in addresses that are linked to FBI sanctions. So these efforts are to try to exclude cryptocurrencies that have moved through very shady channels so that we, we can guarantee that, that whatever system that, that, that is being developed will be relatively uh, immune to such, a, such, a, such abuse, of a, abuse of cryptocurrencies. So... I think that's the kind of model that the world is shifting towards. So the, the, the previous model where it's a free for all and that cryptocurrencies can be used for any sort of nefarious purposes, I think that's going to be uh, a rather uh, odd, correct, uh, odd development that has happened in the past but not likely to carry, for, carry on going forward. Uh, in terms of the central banks wanting increased transparency, wanting increased uh, oversight over transactions, that's a very natural development. And to some extent, it's also necessary to make sure that monetary policy is calibrated correctly uh, and that there's no undue financial risk uh, in the system. So one of the key difference between a central bank digital currency and a private cryptocurrency is that everybody in the country is exposed to, this, to, 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 the, to the domestic currency, but not everybody or only people who choose to invest in cryptocurrencies are exposed to risk in a cryptocurrency, private digital currency spheres, right? So therefore, as a matter of public concern, it's vital for central banks to actually be very clear in terms of what is the risk build up, whether there are there signs of shadow financing or shadow banking that's being conducted using CBDCs or whether or not there's risk of money laundering or, you know, or being usage for nefarious purposes. All this is very key part of CBDC development. I don't see that changing uh, just because uh, digital currencies in the past have been relatively 
uh, have been relatively free reign in terms of uh, providing the degree of anonymity and the degree of um, of uh, of uh, no questions asked approach uh, for cryptocurrency transactions. Right. So expect digital currencies to stick around, but also expect them to be regulated more. I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, William and Samuel, thank you both very much for uh, your participation in this uh, webinar. Uh, the Asia Economist webinar was produced by Martin Tucky and hosted by yours truly, Temur Beg. It is for information only, does not represent any trade recommendations. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams from DBS, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.